All right, uh, good afternoon everybody and thanks for coming to our talk. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, attacks and countermeasures of the uh, ultrasonic cross-device communication mechanisms. Um, I want to begin with telling you a story. It's a story of a product um, made by a company named Silverpush, started about four years ago, actually exactly four years ago now that I notice. Um, and after a while, a couple of years later, they received uh, uh, good funding from a couple of venture capitalists. Um, and this was the, the moment when they started to get some attention uh, from, from, from the media. Journalists were starting to cover uh, what was this technology about and how the product was working. What you see here at the bottom is one year later, the patent describing the technical um, specification of the technology and how the product works. When the patent came out, uh, the security community and the press started to notice that there were some oddities in this, uh, in this technology. What you see here is a screenshot of an email sent on the W3C uh, privacy and audio mailing list by our friends Lucas. Uh, we actually knew him. Um, and he's saying that uh, he wanted to uh, raise the current issue of tracking using ultrasound, ultrasound audio beacons, um, <laughs> such as product marketed by uh, Silverpush. And he's bringing up some transparency issues. And he's saying that users are unaware of this, of what's going on uh, underneath, and they are even unable to express uh, and provide consent, opting out, it was impossible. So this was when also the media started to write uh, several articles uh, about this uh, technology and what could be the privacy and security implications. And I still remember the first one written on Ars Technica by uh, Dan Goodin uh, because I happened to have missed the bus that day and I popped on my Hacker News feed and I read this article. And this is how all these projects started. Um, and then, so journalists were all concerned and uh, as a reaction, a few moments later, also the Federal Trade Commission uh, took an action. Um, this is an uh, excerpt from the transcript of a workshop that the Federal Trade Commission held uh, right away in uh, November, mid-November in Washington, D.C. Um, and to quote some of the, um, some of the transcripts here, uh, are, are the new methods operating in a way that is transparent to consumers? Uh, can this, the, the consumers express any opt-out? Do they have a choice? Um, there is very little transparency here. For example, uh, we would have to essentially find a way to make browsers essentially not emit sounds that humans can hear in order to be able to do some of this stuff. So uh, essentially, the, uh, the Federal Trade Commission was also concerned about the problems of this technology. And we will see what these problems are all about in a, in a few moments. At the point of these stories, uh, the users started to realize what was going on, the end user, I mean, the end users, I mean. Um, and we extracted some of the uh, most uh, representative comments from the blog posts that we found on the net. There were some unhappy users. This guy here saying, this stuff doesn't resemble malware. It is malware. And then we have some proactive dude saying, I want an OS level option in iOS or OS X to roll off the frequencies, uh, the frequency response in the speaker output at a frequency of my choice. 18 kilohertz or 15 kilohertz might, might be fine. And then we have some other uh, funny comments saying, do they know that I turn off the, the sound during commercials? I know that this doesn't really sound funny because some of you might not know uh, what's behind this, and that's what we're going to, uh, to explain now. Um, at this point, the Trade Commission, the Federal Trade Commission, took a second action, a stronger one. They wrote a letter to every developer that were using this technology and were uh, publishing applications. Some of them were probably unaware of it on a Google Play Store. And they say, um, Dear sir, madam, the code included in the application that may allow um, third parties to monitor consumers. We recently discovered that your mobile application includes a software development kit, so a library, uh, created by the company Server Push, that is designed 
sorry, that is designed to run silently in the background even while the user is not actively using the application. And finally, Silver Push re responded to all of these uh, concerns and they claimed that they had no active partnership in the US. What we could find was only an office in California. But they claim that after the Trade Commission uh, like, uh, took this action, they say, we're not seeking any active partnership in the US. So we all thought this was uh, the end of it. But actually, this was only the tip of the iceberg. Uh, what we found out is that there were a whole, uh, a whole world behind this technology that, that was completely unexplored by the security experts. We found some, some, sparse, some sparse articles here and there, but nothing really thorough, nothing really uh, um, uh, like a, a, comp a, a comprehensive analysis. So there were also other ultrasound enabled products that were never analyzed by, from the security point of view. And there were no scientific ex examination of uh, the possible security implications. So uh, at this point of the story, I hope that I uh, motivated at least some of you that this was worth researching. Uh, at least me and Vasilis were persuaded enough that it was uh, you know, worth going into. Uh, and so by, by now, I will start uh, giving you some other background, some more background uh, to tell you what ultrasound tracking really is, technically. Uh, and then Vasilis will take over the floor um, and tell you through a demonstration um, how an attack can be carried out to completely de-anonymize a Tor user. Uh, and then we will, we will explain what are the reasons behind this, so why this technology uh, were like uh, failing so much. And then we will give you uh, our response, our security response to the problems. So starting off with the ecosystem, uh, before we can talk about ultrasound enabled uh, tracking, first I need to tell you something about um, ultrasound. Uh, I need to tell you something about cross-device tracking without ultrasound. Um, generally, cross-device tracking has uh, uh, several applications, such as proximity marketing, etc. But let's dig into the details so you understand immediately. So, uh, cross-device tracking or XDT. Uh, you can think of it as a, as a way to correlate all the devices that you own, essentially. So through an example, let's suppose that our friend John is watching TV and that there is an ad going on on TV. And after a while, John opens his cell phone to browse on the web. And all of a sudden, the advertisers who know that John has just watched that TV show or that TV advertiser, that TV advertisement, they show relevant content on the web relevant to what has just been appeared on TV. So this sounds, I mean, amazing from the point of view of the marketers. This is the holy grail. This is what the marketers would really like to do. Wherever you turn, wherever you turn your, your site, you will have something relevant to what you have just watched at home or on your phone, right? So uh, this technology, I mean, uh, regardless of the use of ultrasounds that we haven't introduced yet, this technology is used uh, by major advertisement networks uh, um, in different ways, depending on the implementation. We can divide uh, uh, between deterministic ones and probabilistic ones. So as you can imagine, the problem that they have to solve is how do we determine that two devices are owned by the same user? So the most basic one that, I, that we, can, uh, we can explain is the deterministic one. So think of using Amazon from your computer, using, your, using the website of Amazon, and then after a while, um, you switch to your phone. Instead of using the app, you open the Amazon website, and most likely you will, have using, you will be using the same credentials. And the fact that you're using the same credential, basically uh, uh, Amazon knows that you are the same person behind two different devices, right? So it can show relevant content to you. Clearly, this is... Uh, fully accurate, I mean, there is, no, uh, there is no possibility of error here. The problem is that it's not always feasible. You cannot really ask every time the users to log in into your platform because you want to retarget the user for the, with the same content uh, being advertised. So this is when uh, ultrasounds and other cross-device linking technology uh, came necessary. So ultrasound beacons is uh, the core technology that is behind ultrasound cross-device tracking. Ultrasound beacons or U-beacons, uh, you can think of them high, as, as uh, high-frequency tags. 
So a sequence of symbols like A, B, C, D that encode uh, a certain information. In this case, this information is this guy has just watched this uh, advertisement on TV. Okay. Uh, and the good thing about ultrasounds in general is that, especially if they are short-lived, they can be easily captured by, uh, by commercial speakers, sorry, by, by commercial microphones, and can be emitted easily by commercial uh, speakers. So you don't really need any fancy technology here. All you need is a speaker and a microphone. So it's like asking people to use Bluetooth without Bluetooth, essentially. So without the, all the, the, the pairing problems that we know that sometimes doesn't really work well. Uh, and the good thing from the marketer's perspective, also from our side, fortunately, is that they're inaudible to us, right? depending on our ears, but most of them are not uh, audible. So more technically, um, they work in the spectrum uh, above 18 kilohertz. Um, and this spectrum, uh, 18 to 20 kilohertz, if you do some math and you split it into 75 hertz chunks, it makes enough space for the whole 27 symbols of the alphabet. So you can encode the whole alphabet by choosing the right frequency. And by emitting these peaks, these frequencies, uh, you can send essentially a message. And in this case, we are sending the AHLSU uh, message, which means, I don't know, a certain uh, advertisement, uh, advertisement campaign. Uh, the duration is pretty, pretty short, a few seconds. <laughs> Uh, and there is, there is no real standard here. There is no agreement on, uh, on how um, content should be encoded, how symbols should be encoded. It's all up to the developer. So you can come up with your encoding, uh, which is, might be more efficient than this, and use it. There is no regulation of any sorts. There are lots of patents, but nothing is, not is really made it to the standards yet. Um, so practically, they travel uh, very well up to seven, eight meters. They cannot really go through obstacles such as thick walls. Um, but as I say, they work very well with commercial speakers. Unfortunately, they are uh, audible by Lara, our research assistant, who has helped us uh, in a very significant way throughout this research. You will see by the end. Um, so then now we have learned uh, that if we combine cross-device tracking uh, application with the use of Ubeacons, we obtain ultrasonic cross-device communication. That is nothing but using ultrasound to, com to combine information about two devices. Um, so the, the, this is actually all good from the marketer's perspective because they offer a very high degree of accuracy, as good as the deterministic ones. There is no requirement for user to, to do any login. Of course, what we are asking the user is to install some client-side component on each device, but then the business model there is very easy. You offer a reward, and the user will probably install that application to get a reward. Um, they work, they can be embedded almost everywhere. They can be embedded into uh, TV shows, TV ads, radio, uh, radio, um, uh, radio emitted advertisements, songs even. Uh, so they are quite flexible in the way they can be used. Uh, on the other hand, they require quite a, a good engineering effort for uh, creating all the back-end infrastructure. We will see uh, why is that. Um, and they require, as I said, on the client side, the installation of an application. Uh, from the development point of view, um, it is nothing different by, from installing a simple advertisement library. So if you are familiar with advertisement library in Android, you simply have to drop a library into your application and load the class, and then you're good to go. What happens behind, uh, behind the scene can be explained with this, um, with this workflow diagram. Um, so what we need is an advertising client, of course. You can think about McDonald's. We found the application of McDonald's in the Philippines making use of this technology. Um, you can think of Starbucks, any good brand who wants to use this technology. Then we need a service provider, in this case, Silver Push or any other service provider offering this technology. Um, so the guy, uh, so the advertisement client go to, goes to um, uh, the provider and say, I want to run a campaign. So they create a beacon. That beacon identifies uniquely that campaign. Then they go to the content provider, who is, for example, a TV channel, a radio channel, who embeds, mix, mixes in, essentially, the inaudible audio uh, together with the audible audio. So what you get in the end 
is the same advertisement, the same audio, but there is also the hidden part that you wouldn't hear. Then we go home, we listen to radio, we, we watch TV, and uh, whenever we access that kind of advertisement of that campaign, our cell phone, which is listening on background, we have installed the application to get some rewards, our cell phone will pick up those ultrasounds so that now we can tell through the back end uh, by reporting back to the advertisement uh, service provider, by reporting back that we have just received that beacon. And so the loop now is closed. Now the advertisement uh, client knows that through the information provided by the service provider, we have just watched that relevant ad advertisement. And then they can retarget us, they can retarget us by proposing relevant, pro relevant products, and in the end, uh, this will re uh, translate in some return on this investment. There are also some other applications in, uh, in the scope of ultrasound technology. For example, proximity marketing. This is a product by uh, Shopkick, a company um, in, uh, uh, in the Silicon Valley, which proposed to use uh, um, ultrasound beacons for indoor localization. Not really localization in the, matter of, in the sense of positioning of a user, uh, but localization in the sense that a user is here, in this store. So, if I have a user and I invite my users to install my application because I want to offer some rewards, some discounts, then whenever my, my clients walk into the store, I can offer instant deals or something that is relevant to the, to the fact that the guy is into the store at that moment. At the top here, you see the powered version. At the bottom here, you can see the battery powered version. And then you can use this data the way, the way you, you want. You can study the in-store user behavior. You can retarget users, as I told you before. There are other uses, use cases. Some of, uh, one of them, you might, you might also have used it without knowing it. If you own uh, Google Cast, uh, formerly Chromecast, uh, they said in their documentation that they use ultrasounds as one of the ways to pair your phone with a Chromecast. So in, uh, in addition of wireless, uh, wireless pairing, uh, they can use ultrasounds to pair. Because they assume that when you configure your Chromecast, you're close to TV with your phone in your hand. Um, by the way, we just understood that Google has acquired Leak Login, which is a, a startup uh, doing sound-based authentication. So that's, that's quite interesting. And there are also uh, other uh, other applications for these technologies, such as audience measurement, analytics, such as in big events, uh, if you have like uh, the application of uh, the marketing application for that event, such as Black Hat or a sport, a large sport event, you can measure how many people are currently into a certain location by beeping out uh, ultrasound beacons and then collecting them through, uh, through these uh, sensors. <coughs> Right, uh, <clears throat> so this is uh, the moment of our story where uh, I realized that probably something is wrong. I mean, there, there is something that must be, uh, that we must dig further. Um, and so I will do the same thing that I did in real life uh, six, eight months ago. I went to Vasilis, who was working in the same lab where I was doing a, a research visit, and I say, hey, dude, I think we have a little problem here. Uh, we, we might want to look into this technology because there is something that it, it smells a little, a little bit fishy. So I will give the floor to, uh, to Vasilis, who is going to, to give us a, a demonstration. Unfortunately, I think we have a, a... Oh, yes, that's right. That's right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So Vasilis, at that point, was a PhD student. Uh, now he's a PhD student at UCL. But when I met him, we were both at uh, UCSB together with Shuang Hao, uh, Yannick Fratantonio, and, of course, the advisors, uh, Chris Krugel and Giovanni Vigna. And uh, he was working on privacy. So I thought this is the right guy for this project, and so we started to, to collaborate on this. So without further ado, demonstration time. So hello, everyone. Um, now that we have a, a good understanding of how the whole ecosystem works, I'm, I'm going to immediately go ahead and demonstrate one of our attacks, because I assume that some of you may have already started imagining how this can be exploited. So the ingredients for this attack um, we need basically a victim with a computer that has speakers and the Tor browser. And we also need a victim, the same victim to have a, a smartphone that uh, features uh, uh, an ultrasound cross-device tracking enabled app. So any app with a framework 
doing cross device tracking. And uh, we also need a state level adversary. I will explain this further a bit later. So, in order to better understand what's going on on our demo, um, I'm gonna. Cap I ca we came up with a little story. So we assume that there is a whistleblower that wants to leak some documents to a journalist. Um, however, the whistleblower doesn't know that the journalist um, secretly works with a repressive government and intends to uh, de-anonymize him. So what the de journalist does is that he asks the whistleblower to upload the documents through a Tor hidden service that he owns, um, make, I mean, uh, claiming that, uh, you know, you're going to be safe, you're going to use Tor, and um, I, I won't be able to know your identity. So the whistleblower is com um, believes what the, the journalist says, and he fires up Tor and loads the page. So there is a small lie on this slide, and this is the part that the demo is live. So apparently the network here doesn't like Tor very much, so we have the fallback plan of a video that we're going to show you, and I'm going to explain what's going on there. I mean, we're brave, but not that brave. <laughs> okay, so there is a computer um, that um, has a Tor browser loaded. It's okay. You want to zoom in? No, I'll just make it on full screen. Maybe from here. Yeah. Okay. So there is a phone, and um, the, the computer has a is a running Tor browser, latest version, and there is a phone. So for this specific demo, we used the Silver Push demo app um, just to be able to show you something on the on the smartphone. But normally, you wouldn't be able to uh, see anything there. So what happens here is just the app now loaded, but it's still not listening. So we'll press the button to make it listening. Um, this process doesn't happen normally. Normally, the framework is listening on the background, and the user doesn't have to do anything, apart from maybe starting up, firing up the app. That uh, its purpose, its main purpose, is something else. So now we're going to visit the uh, on the Tor browser the uh, Onion service that uh, the journalist asked us to visit as a whistleblower, and see what happens. So we visit the website, and it looks benign at first, and then it updates itself. OK, so what we have here is basically the website updated, and it contains basically lots of private information about um, us. So essentially, uh, we can see on top the um, Google account email address, the, the IP address um, that the uh, mobile that the smartphone has, uh, the phone number, the Android ID. Uh, please don't call on this phone number. Um, um, uh, the email of the phone and uh, the MAC address. So this pretty much the anonymizes the um, the whistleblower and um, the protection offered by Tor is not really there. So now I'm just going back to the presentation to better explain what happened and um, uh, discuss um, how, how we actually did that. Yeah. Before that, I would like to introduce three tools that the attacker has at his disposal. And he, use, he can use them, combine them to um, do more complex attacks. So the first one is, um, is a big trap. This is my favorite. And um, Beacon Trap is pretty simple uh, in principle. So it's basically a code snippet that, when loaded, uh, reproduces one or more um, inaudible beacons that the attacker has uh, chosen. So this by itself, it's nothing, not a big deal. However, what the adversary can do is that he can attach uh, this code snippet to a resource that the victim, victim is interested in. So in the first case, and this is what we saw on the, live, on the, on the demo, um, this um, web page can be a, a, a benign looking web page that the uh, journalist is going to lure the whistleblower to visit. However, this can be a completely benign website that has no idea about the attacker and simply has a store that uh, cross, cross uh, site scripting vulnerability that the adversary is going to exploit. Or 
the adversary can uh, mount basically a man in the middle attack and just drop this snippet on the on, play, on plain text traffic that he observes. Or he can record the message and incorporate this uh, a pre-recorded beacon in this message. Uh, so when the victim plays it, uh, the beacon is emitted as well. Um, the common factor in all these cases is, is that um, the framework on the mobile device has no way of knowing where this beacon is coming from. So what's happening is basically the beacon is emitted by the uh, laptop or the other device. The framework is picking it up, but it can't really tell if it's coming from an advertiser or an adversary. So it looks the same to the framework. And this um, enables the attacker to also do some um, other things. One of them is beacon injection. Basically, the attacker is able to push, push beacons um, in the frameworks running on the um, victim's devices. And uh, then the devices are going to handle them, handle them as a normal beacons. So they are going to push them back to the back end, as Federico explained previously. So what could happen is that an adversary can walk um, with his smartphone um, on a popular store on, uh, on uh, rush hour. And then has, uh, through his uh, smartphone speakers, he may emit some ultrasounds, uh, ultrasound beacons. And then all customers who run um, uh, cross uh, cross-device tracking frameworks um, with ultrasounds on their devices will pick them up and report them back to the company's backend. Um, the other thing that the attacker can do is basically a variation of this. He can also record beacons from other sources like an ad or a website and replay them um, to his or the victim's devices. Combining all this, now we present our first attack. So our first attack is basically what we saw in the demo. We're going to explain how we did it. So the first step is for the adversary to set up um, um, an advertising campaign with any provider uh, providing such services. This is step one. So on step two, uh, the adversary is basically capturing the uh, beacon from the beacon trap and, se and sets a beacon trap with that specific beacon. In our case, this was a Tor hidden service. It can be whatever resource the, attack, the adversary chooses it to be. And then on the third step, somehow layer the, visit, the user to visit this um, um, resource. So on the fourth step, and when the user loads the resource, um, his device, in this case a laptop, basically renders the content and emits the um, uh, ultrasound beacon, as we see on step five. Um, Following that, his smartphone is going to pick up the um, ultrasound beacon and report it back on the tracking provider, which is step six. And of course, um, given that we have a state level adversary, he can go to the um, service provider and say, you know, can you please let me know who, this, who the guy, uh, let me know the IP address and the other um, identifiers that you have collected for this guy. Um, so yeah the um, whistleblower gets fully de-anonymized that way. However, in the beacon, as we said previously, we don't really have um, state-level adversary handy. But what we have is uh, the latest version of Tor, a computer with speakers, and um, a smartphone uh, which is running an ultrasound-enabled framework. So since we didn't have the state-level adversary, what we did is that we simulated one. And I'm going to explain how we did that. So. The only difference uh, with the attack that we observed previously is that on uh, step six, instead of sending the um, identifiers to the ultrasound um, service provider, we redirected them to the back end of the adversary. And that, that's the only difference. However, we want to stress this point that getting data from providers, it's not that hard. So recently, there, is, there was this. Um, um, spying story about AT&T coming up the news, where apparently it's very easy to, with an administrative subpoena to ask, um, which doesn't need to be obtained by a judge, by the way, um, to ask for non-content information. So yeah, um, step seven seems very likely to happen and very easy for governments and uh, secret services, I assume. There are two more attacks that we came up with. So the first one, is based on the user profiling that the advertisers like to do. So advertisers uh, always try to um, 
or, or at least in most cases, try to profile their users based on their interests and behaviors. So the attacker can actually exploit this by injecting beacons to an unsuspecting victim and thus influencing the profile that the advertiser is building for them. So as we can see on the picture, the, adver the uh, adversary can simply replay beacons or inject beacons that he is crafting to the victim's device and then the device is gonna report them back to the backend, thus affecting the profile. So of course, the degree that this attack uh, affects the profile depends exactly on the implementation that the advertiser has done. Uh, the other attack, the third one that we came up with is the information leakage attack. So in this case, the, the attacker is trying to make his um, profile identical to that of the victim. And to do that, he's basically dropping for beacons and he's replaying them to his own device. And then, of course, his device is pushing them back to the backend. So again, depending on how prof the profiling techniques work and how the recommendation system is implemented by the tracking provider, the profiles can be done very, can be made very identical or similar. And then um, the content pushed to the uh, adversary will be very similar to uh, that pushed to the victim's um, device. So after all these attacks and uh, you know, playing around with the ecosystem, we started wondering, okay, um, why are all those things possible? What are the formal reasons? So we did the formal security evaluation of the ecosystem and we came up with four points um, that need to be uh, considered. So the first one is that we believe that the threat model used by uh, lots of companies is kind of inaccurate. The second one is that um, Ultrasound beacons, in the great majority of cases, lack um, some necessary security features. Also, a fundamental security principle is violated, and um, there is also a lack of transparency when it comes to informing the users and a few other things. So the first one, the threat model, is basically relying on the assumption that um, the ultrasounds have a limited transmission range. So and also assumes that the attacker has no physical proximity to the victim and the attacker is not able to capture and replay beacons. However, ultrasounds can tra um, travel reliably for a few meters. In our experiments, as Federico said, this is like six to seven meters. And there are other ways to get virtually close to the uh, victim, such as beacon traps that we introduced previously. Um, the, second, the second area that we um, would like to point out is uh, the lack of authentication and encryption capabilities uh, of few beacons. So this is mainly uh, associated with the, the use cases that uh, beacons are used uh, in. So the channel, the ultrasound channel has relatively low bandwidth. That's one thing. Um, the users are available for a limited time. So when you walk in a supermarket, you don't want to stand uh, on a specific, you are not going to stand on a specific uh, location for very long. So the advertisers have a limited time to push things into your phone. Plus, public places are usually noisy, thus increasing the um, transmission uh, errors. All these result um, in a um, lack of authentication encryption capabilities, thus enabling replay and injection attacks. Um, the third problem that we observed is the violation of the principle of least privilege. So what's happening is that currently, all the ultrasound-based uh, applications need to have full access to the microphone. So this means that they gain unnecessary access to also audible frequencies. And uh, if they want to do the right thing and gain access to the ultrasound spectrum only, this is not possible currently. So of course, this comes with some consequences. The first one is that if there is a malicious developer, he can misuse this access to the microphone. I mean, he can claim um, that he will do ultrasound cross-device tracking or something else and also if drop on the user. Or, um, I, and another thing that's happening is that um, ultrasound enabled apps are perceived often by uh, users as malicious because it creates some sort of suspicion gaining access to the microphone and listening on the background. So the third problem is lack of the lack of transparency. Um, we observed the large discrepancies between um, uh, the strategies that the companies and the apps are following when it comes to informing the users. So for instance, 
Um, some companies were doing a better job, some were not doing, were not doing a good job at all. And uh, the same thing we observed when it comes to opt-out options, which also vary a lot. Um, it's also interesting here that framework developers are in a strange position because they advise their customers who want to embed the framework on their applications to um, follow proper practices, but the, there is no much, um, um, they don't do much to enforce them into using proper practices. So this results in the following thing happening. So some MBA teams um, on May 10th announced that they're gonna use a, an ultrasound um, framework um, to do some proximity marketing, I think. So this was in May, the 10th of May, and later in August, they got sued both the app developer and the company. Um, what's interesting in this story is that um, in the complaint, the, um, the user acknowledges the fact that um, the app is asking for permission to access the microphone. However, what it says is that they are not given enough information to understand what's the reason for this request. So this goes back to transparency and, of course, overprivileging users. And then other case here, July 19th, start using the framework, and then um, users are um, filing a lawsuit complaining that they systematically intercept uh, consumers' oral communications. Apparently, according to the lawsuit, at least, the app was listening to um, the microphone in, for all the users um, regardless of where, where they were in the church or the home or work. So now that we've put uh, all those things down, we, uh, we would like to give you a much better perspective of how prevalent the problem is or how and how many users it affects. It affects. So the ecosystem is indeed growing very fast. There are new companies coming out and um, products appear at a fast pace. However, the good news is that we believe that a relatively low number of users is affected at this point. So there are about 10 companies offering ultrasound um, tracking products currently, and the great majority of them is um, uh, interested mainly in proximity marketing. There is only one company offering uh, ultrasound cross-device tracking, and we believe that not more companies have jumped into this market because the infra infrastructure required for this is quite complicated. Plus, this whole backslash with um, the Federal Trade Commission and everything else uh, disincentivized them from joining, fearing that they, will, they may tarnish their reputation, I guess. So now that we have a formal evaluation of the problems in the ecosystem, um, we decided that it would be better if we provided some solution as well. So our first, the first part of our solution um, is the countermeasures that we developed. The countermeasures are um, short-term and medium-term. First one is our browser extension. Browser extension um, works on Chrome. What it does is basically filters all audio sources and removes the ultrasound beacons uh, before they are um, emitted by the, uh, mic by the speakers in, of the device. It uses the web um, audio API provided by HTML5. Uh, it's a simple high, filter, high cell filter, filter that attenuates all frequencies above uh, 18 kilohertz. And um, um, to do that, we identify all the audio sources on the page and the destinations. The destinations are usually the speakers of the device and then rewire all the audio paths going from the sources to the destinations to include that filter. Um, the limitation here is that because of some technical things in uh, HTML5, this doesn't work with legacy technologies. Uh, for instance, Flash is one uh, example that we found. The second uh, short-term countermeasure we came up with um, is, the, is our Android permission. So we created a patch for the Android permission system that allows, allows for finer, finer grained control over the audio channel. Um, and this um, provides the capabilities to separate between the permissions uh, for listening to audible sound and, the, and um, the, um, regulates, the access, uh, regulates access to the ultrasonic spectrum. Um, 
as a result, this will force the applications to de definitely explicitly declare their intention to um, capture sound from the inaudible spectrum, and then, uh, as a result, enable users to selectively um, filter the ultrasound frequencies out and thus um, preventing applications from performing uh, cross-device tracking or anything else. We also filed a Torbac um, uh, report and um, it's currently being discussed what's the best solution and if this is something that Tor needs to address or not. However, we believe that these are only short and maybe medium-term countermeasures and um, in order to fix the ecosystem in the long term, would like to argue for um, standardizing it. So we would like to initiate the discussion for agreeing on a common uh, ultrasound beacon format and ma mainly um, also decide what features, uh, security features, um, ultrasound beacons will have. And then when it's done, we're, we would be able to develop some um, um, APIs on the operating system level. So these APIs will provide methods to discover um, beacons, process, generate, and possibly emit them, uh, and will enable the apps to do that without any access to the device microphone, but instead they will ask for permission to access this uh, specific API. It's very similar to what's happening to Bluetooth. The benefits of this are um, multiple. So first, it solves the problem of overprivileging apps. Um, because now the applications have no need to access the microphone. Um, it also eliminates the risk that uh, current applications uh, run that uh, they may be considered as spying by the users, as we, as we saw previously. And of course, resolves the problem of microphone locking. So we, um, we saw this in our experiments. What happens is that the microphone is a resource that when one app is, has access to it, another application is not able to um, basically gain access to that at the same time. So when we were running a ultrasound um, cross-device tracking framework, listening to the microphone, the camera app, for instance, was crashing. So the API will probably prioritize who gets access to the microphone and so resolve this problem. So now um, there is a corner case that we would like to address. And this is, so okay, a developer may say, you know, I, wanna, I don't wanna follow the standard, I wanna develop my own beacon format and I'm going to do it the old-fashioned way, I will ask, ask for access to the microphone. To prevent this from happening, what we suggest is basically um, for Android and other uh, mobile platforms to filter out the ultrasonic frequencies captured by the microphone by default, and then provide um, some sort of interface for the user to grant access to the whole spectrum on a per-application basis, if the user um, wants to do that. So now I'm going to hand it back to the to Federico for the conclusions of this talk. Thank you, Vasilis. And so uh, we've learned uh, what cross device tracking is. We've learned what uh, ultrasound cross device tracking is. Um, we've also seen. Um, uh, how by reversing some apps that uh, by some reversing work that we did uh, we learned how uh, this was implemented in real world apps uh, and then we gave you uh, a list of the shortcomings that we have uh, found also Vasilis gave you a demo on how this technology can be abused by a state level attacker to de-anonymize like uh, whistleblower, for example, who any, or any other user using Tor. Uh, and we have seen that uh, the, the key technology, the, the, the key problem here is that the attacker was able to get close, virtually close to the victim by simply <coughs> uploading a malicious banner or a malicious uh, multimedia resource on a page emitting the ultrasounds that would have been picked up uh, from the phone. Um, and then we... Uh, we gave you an overview of all the countermeasures that we provide. And hopefully, we will be able, uh, with this talk uh, and with the, with the media attention that we received so far, uh, to start a discussion, a long-term discussion, I think will, we think will take a few, a few years uh, to get implemented, hopefully, 
on, uh, on the problem of how can we get to standardize uh, ultrasounds in the same way we have Bluetooth, for instance. If you can think, I like the analogy of uh, the allocation of radio frequencies. Like if you want to use a certain, uh, a certain channel in a radio, a certain frequency you want to transmit and receive in that frequency, at least you want to receive a license for it. At least you need to inform uh, the authorities that you are using that frequency. And all the applications that are using uh, the radio spectrum uh, are, have to be certified, have to go through a series of inspections. We would like ultrasounds, if they, if they are really going to become the next main uh, proximity communication technology, we would like them to go through this, all these standardization steps. We think this is a, a step one, where step zero is we have to make the decision makers and the policy makers aware of what are the privacy and security implications of this technology. But there's more to do. I mean, after that, I say this is step zero and step one. Uh, there's more to do. Step two is that the developers uh, should start becoming aware of this and explicitly notify when they are implementing an app that uses ultrasounds or when they are incorporating a framework that uses ultrasound cross-device tracking uh, technology to inform the users what's, about what's going on underneath. For example, by analyzing some of the apps that we found on the Play Store, I mean, the results were mixed. We found some applications that were informing the users about it, and we also found some applications making no mention, absolutely no mention about what was going on. Um, we are not sure, but maybe some developers could have just incorporated the framework thinking of uh, like being unaware of this and simply thinking it uh, as, a, as a simple advertising framework that uses a new technology. So they were unaware of all the security implications. Um, the best would be if the developers offer an opt-out, uh, or better, an opt-in solution so that the users can decide whether or not they want to uh, continue using this technology or from some point on, they say, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to use this anymore and switch off the uh, uh, capturing of ultrasounds. So here, of course, there is a, uh, a conflict of interest, really. Like, uh, like in any other advertisement library, there is a balance between how much advertisement you want to show and how much you want to like, uh, guarantee some level of privacy for the users. So here, there is a, a very delicate balance between uh, between these two uh, two issues that, of course, the developer has to take a decision on it. And then uh, what you see here at the bottom is, uh, is what we found on a real-world application, not a demo application. This is real-world application incorporating the Silverpush framework. So the developer simply took the SDK from the Silverpush website, incorporated it into the, well, into the application, and you can see here at the bottom let me see if I can move the cursor without screwing everything up. You can see here the name of the app. It was History GK. I'm not sure if it's still on the Play Store. I think it was uh, an application to uh, think of read uh, a, a book or something like that. And it was incorporating this framework. And you can see that not only it is transmitting all possible information that you can think of, invading any, any kind of privacy level, but also it was doing that in plain text. And this is not the developer's choice. This is the framework provider's choice. Plain text by default. Not on the demo app, on the framework. So uh, the other step is that uh, framework providers, such as Silverpush, and the, the one that would, will come next, hopefully, uh, we'll have to be aware of, is that they have, instead of not enforcing security practices, such as in this case, they will have to embed technical mechanisms to, I would say, forcefully inform the users about what was going on. For instance, instead of uh, letting the developer decide on whether and how to inform the users, they could have some like notification screen popping up the first time uh, the user loads an application that uses this library. I'm not sure how this could be implemented in Android, but there must be a way using a library, a framework, that when it's loaded in an application for the first time, 
you can show up, you can show up a, a pop-up saying, hey, you know, this application is using ad library, blah, 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 which is using ultrasounds. If you want to know more, go here. If you want to disable this, simply hit uh, disable, something like this. Um, and everyone, we should, we should, I mean, our, uh, as I, I want to stress, we want to stress it again, uh, what everyone should do is to contribute, if you want, to this standardization of beacons. Um, so that hopefully we will see in a, in a, in a couple of years, uh, or maybe, maybe earlier, we will see uh, uh, OS level APIs providing uh, dedicated access to these resources, as Vasily says, um, as explained, so that developers will be able to develop applications in a fully secure way uh, and in a regulated way that respects the standards. Um, we believe that there must be also a way, although we, we couldn't find technically how to do it, uh, there must be a way to um, squeeze some authentication information in the very low bandwidth that the ultrasonic uh, uh, medium offers. And if that, if that is possible, then some of the problems that we have seen, uh, such as the reply attack, wouldn't be possible again, because every beacon would be authenticated and maybe time-stamped in a way that cannot be reused. So with this, uh, we would like to conclude, and what you can see here is, again, our research assistant, Lara, who played key role in our experiments. I think we, can, we have a demo, a demo of her moving her here like that when we were doing experiments. Uh, so if there are any questions, we are super happy to answer them uh, even now or after the, the end of this talk. Um, we also set up a reference website that uh, hosts all the information that uh, is useful for uh, anyone who is curious about uh, this project and uh, uh, for also the media who who came to us in, from various sources asking us several questions, we, we are trying to maintain a list of frequently asked questions. So if you have questions, there is a, a button on the website that you can, uh, you can use to submit a question, and we will try to answer them. So uh, if you want to join us in this uh, effort to secure ultrasound-based uh, cross-device communi uh, communication techniques, go on ubixec.org. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. So uh, I was wondering if, as a very quick and fancy mitigation technique, uh, if we could have ultrasound uh, boxes, as I say, anti ultrasound boxes, mm -hmm. one for the home, one for the office, something like that, yeah. to cancel out the. Uh, okay, the answer that. So I, I know it would be problematic okay, for animals, okay. you know, for those people that are pets, but do you think it would be possible for now? Okay, that's a, a very interesting question. That was, uh, I will repeat it for, for the recordings. Um, our, our friend here is asking if there is the possibility of implementing a like anti-ultrasound box that I can keep next to me nearby my office or in, in, into my office or in my pocket that is kind of a listening to any ultrasound beacons in the air and emitting counter ultrasound so that to neutralize uh, the, 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 the receival of ultrasound beacons. Is that what you were asking? Uh, this was one of the first ideas that we came up with, uh, and this would have been our shortest term solution, so give you a device that you can, you can keep next to you. Uh, but actually, there is a problem in the, in the physics of um, ultra, the ultrasound <coughs> waves. When you go very, very, uh, to very, very short um, wavelengths. Uh, since they are propagating in a, in a real, uh, like in a non-vacuumed space, what happens is that uh, it is very hard to record the ultrasound and at the same time being able to counter ultrasound, to counter, to counter effect that ultrasound. And actually what you come up with is that you, have, you can have some diffraction between the waves and actually mix up uh, your counter wave with the original wave, and so amplify the ultrasound, the resulting ultrasound. Um, 
That's why if you have like uh, headphones from Bose, noise cancelling ones, they cannot really filter uh, high frequency noises. That's why they have all the, uh, the physical material to try to filter them. They work very well with the long waves because they have all the time to synchronize to the wave. But that's a very, very interesting solution. Yeah, we have one from Marco. Yeah, I was <coughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, so the question is basically if those attacks can be implemented without actually using the ultrasound spectrum, but in, in the audible frequency spectrum, right? So it's definitely possible. And actually there are companies that are doing cross-device tracking and similar offering similar services within the audible spectrum. Um, using multiple techniques differently, um, different uh, with each other and uh, usually patented. So it's definitely possible and um, this is can, kind of harder to deal with. But um, it, from our research, it seems that it's a less populated ecosystem compared to the ultrasound one. But uh, nevertheless, it's absolutely a very um, possible uh, thing to do. So if I understood correctly, but please uh, follow up if I haven't, um, you're asking whether we found uh, cases of uh, governments or like uh, agencies using these techniques. What? Okay. Well, uh, all, we haven't found cases. I mean, we cannot really tell that we have found any case um, about this. Uh, but we can say, as the example that provided, uh, that Vasilis provided, that um, maybe it doesn't even require you to be uh, uh, the secret services or uh, like the government to obtain uh, a subpoena in order to go to the, uh, to the provider and ask for the information that you need. Um, so we would say that, uh, we, I mean, I can repeat, we haven't seen any of these cases, but um, it is not I, I, as hard. I think about a scenario where you record everything. You have everything that's in the receives, and you only emit the signal from the Do you actually need any other service to get the data? Well, depends on exactly when, depends on, depends on where you want to pick up the sound. How far you want, on phone? Yeah, identify the hacker or somebody. So this is a very interesting question. Shall we take it offline? Because I think there are some technical... Um, uh, are there any other questions? Or? Okay. So a simple countermeasure would be driving down the speaking of the computer. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Uh, what I, I can follow up on the on the browser extension that we are providing. That that's one click solution. You install the uh, browser extension, and you have a sort of a personal sound sound firewall that chops off the frequencies that are known to be uh, used by these providers. And you can selectively change the frequency depending on on your need. So you don't really need to cut off all the all the spectrum. You can simply cut off uh, the dangerous one. But as Marco said before. Uh, if we come up with audio steganography, then yes, probably the only solution would be to completely turn off the speakers. What do you think? So this would be um, a nuclear approach, right? It's going to kill the ecosystem. Um, it, it would definitely work. Another thing that would work is that on the latest versions of Android, you can go through all your apps and disable access to the microphone. You can do this as well. But um, 
and in the short term, this could be a solution, even though there is a use usability penalty, I assume, uh, by disabling your speakers um, in general. Um, what we are trying to do is to push for a solution that doesn't kill the whole ecosystem, but fixes the security problems associated with it. And yeah. There are good cases, good use cases for the ecosystem. I mean, it's okay to have uh, a, a better way to advertise products. We understand this, and, uh, but yeah, if we kill the ecosystem, that's never gonna happen. Just one question, what do you think about security of applications that you listen like Siri So we've got this question also from some journalists, and um, I really don't know. I mean, it's very hard to convince people. We saw this also in this case that you're using the microphone, but you're not really listening, right? It's counterintuitive. And um, um, I think I trust them, but um, you never know. Like, um, no one would really... Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, um, in the ultrasound ecosystem, I think that um, <clears throat> apart from being a bit, um, apart from being completely opaque for users, like not informing them at all from for what they are doing, I don't think they were misusing the access to the, the permissions to access the microphone. We haven't found any app recording the whole spectrum. Any other questions? Thanks a lot. Oh, there's one. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, stop, stop. stop. <laughs> so this uh, this is a tough question because um, um, we weren't able to, you know, you don't know all the frameworks. The um, the advertisers are kind of secretive with the um, frameworks. They don't provide it uh, openly on the web. So I think there are references that there were around 70 apps, 67, I think, something like this. Yeah. Um, the number is um, kind of unknown, I would say, because after the whole backslash, many developers basically remove the framework out of fear for their users. So it, it's currently fluctuate, fluctuating, right? So I'm saying about the number of users who might have downloaded these apps. Uh, yeah, so the apps, uh, the 67 apps, I was referring mainly to uh, ultrasound cross device tracking. The users were nearly a few millions, I would say. Yeah, a few million. According to the Google metadata, a few million users might have downloaded these applications. But the proximity marketing apps have way more users. I have no way to see if it's You will have to scan the entire uh, Play Store, download all of them, and see if you, if you find evidence of the SDK that we mentioned. So it's, a, it's doable, definitely. Yeah. Not trivial. I mean, it's a it's a Google question. I mean, it's for Google. <laughs> thank all you. Right, thank you all.